So good evening. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome everyone this evening to enjoy the insight and humanity of Rabbi David Stav. Rav Stav is the chief rabbi of the city of Shoham, the chairman of the Tsohar organization, and serves as a rabbi for the Ezra Youth Movement. Rav Stav is a graduate of Yeshivat Merkaz Arav and a Talmud of the late Rabbi Abraham Sh uh, Avram Shapira. He has Dayanut, served in the IDF Armored Corps, and has held several senior yeshiva and educational positions. Rostav is most widely known at the moment for his work with Tsohar, which he founded in 2009. And while Tsohar exists to pave the way for a more ethical and joyful approach to Jewish life in Israel and bring Israelis closer to their Jewish heritage, it has nonetheless had a significant international reach as a source for halachic solutions to ethical problems and Psak Halacha with Seichel. As a charity, Soha strives to be non-political. However, in challenging the establishment, Rav Stav and his team have certainly found themselves at the heart of significant controversies. One of the most significant themes of the three weeks between the 17th of Tammuz, which begins this evening, and Tisha B'Av in three weeks time, is the damage done to Israel through Sinat Chinam, unnecessary schism and hatred between Jews. In many respects, Tsohar built across the perceptual chasm between religious authority and the large number of non-affiliated or alienated Jewish members of Israeli society. It aspires to provide an understanding, accessible, contemporary, friendly, no strings can do approach. Rav Stav sees Tsohar as a dominant and promising, so, uh, and promising social, the Jewish place of choice for a generation who spurn coercion and crave respect, relevance and variety when it comes to their Jewish experience. Former British Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says, so many Jews feel the religious world is looking down on them. Tsohar says, be part of this heritage it is yours as much as it's ours. I was privileged to meet Rav Tzav when I was still in, in Sydney and to have him as one of the first scholars in residence that I hosted here in Kinloss. He's assisted in weddings in Israel for members of both communities for which I am most grateful. As with our previous conversations, I've put everyone on mute at the moment. Please feel free to write comments in the chat box or to raise your hand if you have any particular questions and you'll find the raise my hand key in the three dots of the participants tab. I'm delighted to welcome Rav Stav via Zoom to Kinloss this evening. Good evening, Rav Stav. Good evening to everyone, and I really admire your arrogance that at that uh, time at night, 8.30, uh, and leave their uh, issues and deal, and are dedicating the time for uh, this uh, discussion. Well, all the more we, we, we thank you because it's 10.30 where you are, so uh, okay. uh, you know, it's right well, into Shabbat. the beginning of the night. It's the beginning of the night. When, when you were growing up, I'm gonna, uh, well, right. when you were growing up, did you imagine yourself as destined to have a career? Hang on, I've muted everybody which will have muted you. Um, no, you're, you're unmuted. Um, I, when you were growing up, did you imagine yourself as destined to have a career in rabbinic leadership? And I have on, okay, yeah. Uh, now I'm muted. Now you're unmuted. Okay. Um, okay. I, I received the decision, I took the decision to become a rabbi in my second year in yeshiva. I originally, me and my parents wanted me to be a lawyer. And actually that's uh, where I directed myself. But I remember the day when one of my chavrutot, the guy that I used to learn with, in the yeshiva says to me, you know, people could change history or learn about history. To which kind of people do you want to belong to? Do you want to change or do you want to learn about others' changes. So I said, I think I want to change. So he said, if that's the case, so then you have to be a rabbi. Because here is where the changes are done. So if you want to influence people 
And if you want to make an impact, be with us. So that's where I took the decision to be a rabbi. So in a decision to change the world, you must have had people who influenced you and were, uh, uh, inspired you in your, in your hashkafa. Uh, it could be from history or people who are your teachers. Uh, who particularly influenced Rav Stav? I think that the most important uh, figure was my mother. Um, my mother was a daughter of a very famous rabbi in Yerushalayim. When next time when you come to visit Yerushalayim, hopefully soon, when the corona will be over, next door to the Supreme Court, between the Supreme Court and the Knesset, there is a small cemetery with a um, grave that thousands of people come to daven there, to pray there. And that's the grave of my grandpa. And my mother, as his daughter, used to to tell me always, you ought to be a mensch before you'll be a scholar, before you'll be a rabbi. Derech Eretz Kadma Le Torah. Derech Eretz Kadma Le Torah. Or as we say in the sacrifices, Leolam Yehe Adam, Yere Shamaim Baseter Uvagalui. So you have to be Adam, you have to be a, a human being before you are. Uh, fearing God. And I think that's the first lesson. And I think she influenced me the most. In the way of learning, of analyzing, it's my father. My father was a big scholar, but he was a librarian. He wasn't, he didn't do his career as a rabbi. He learned in Lublin before World War II, in the very famous yeshiva there of mm -hmm. Meir Shapira. And he always dedicated me, uh, educated me to not to give up and not to say, well, that's the way the Gemara answers. If you don't feel comfortable, keep on asking. If Rashi is not good for you, ask him. Don't hesitate to criticize. You have to feel free and you have to feel frank when you analyze Gemara. And uh, these are the figures that influenced me the most. Right, and uh, what prompted you to set up Tzohar? The murder of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. I mean, for us now, you know, we look at it already 25 years later, it's a, it seems to be a history. But at that time, I mean, we are now commemorating tonight and tomorrow, Shivasa Betamus. If we want to understand what is Tisha B'av and what is Shivasa Betamus, is just to look at Israel in uh, 25 years ago to see how the division, the split between right and left. I mean, to see today the hatred between ultra-Orthodox and secular people and to see the gaps that were created between people. I, I, I'm just, you know, I don't want to speak Loshonora on Shiva Sabetamus, but just to give you the feeling, a sense of the feeling, Yesterday, I read an article that describes how a taxi driver, Israeli taxi driver, takes a woman, a Haredi woman, in Ashdod, and then he starts to curse her. And he says, well, you, the Haredi, you are responsible for, uh, for the corona. You brought the corona. And, you are and he threw her out from the taxi while he was driving. And then he, he threw afterwards the, the, her bed. Now, I'm not saying that uh, a dispute is not legitimate. I know what dispute is about. Our tradition of Torah is full with debates between rabbis. But such a hatred that, that led to the murder of Yitzhak Rabin and could lead easily to other murders, this was the motivation to establish Tzohar as an organization that will try to bridge the gaps between observant people and secular people. So which are the particular gaps that you saw that Tsohar leapt into the Gulf for? So we started with, with weddings. In Israel, unlike England and other Western countries, um, weddings had to be done through the rabbinate. 
An establishment, as every establishment, as every monopoly, doesn't treat its, its customers in a proper way. There is no situation just like in your community that every synagogue, every congregation has its rabbi, and the rabbi knows that he has to speak nicely to his congregants because otherwise he will not have the job anymore. That's not the case in Israel because no community, the secular people do not belong to any community. The rabbi is appointed by the government. He doesn't feel committed to his congregants. He, does, he treats them from, as you quoted Rabbi Sachs a few minutes ago, he treats them uh, from, up, he, looks, he looks at them from upside down. I would like to, to quote another co quotation from, from Rabbi Sachs, which I really uh, love. And that's when he said, and he says it f several times, that we used to be the chosen people, but today we are the choosing people. Because we have, just when there were airlines, we, the, the crew used to announce, we know that you have, you could choose another airline. We really appreciate the fact that you have decided to choose British Airways or El Al. Well, the rabbinate or the establishment didn't understand that the Israelis want to have the choice and want to choose between options. And once you treat customers as captive audience, they respond in, a, in, the, in, in the same way. And uh, uh, they respond according, accordingly. And that's exactly what happened. So we started with weddings, to make weddings in a nice way, to expose, uh, the couples to a uh, bride counseling in a way that will inspire them and will not threaten them. But afterwards we realized that the main problem is that 20% of the Israeli society cannot get married in Israel, not because they are not Jewish, but because they don't know how to prove that they are Jewish. And let me give you an example from England. And we have plenty of examples from England. If somebody comes from England, and let's say he comes from, uh, his parents got married civilly, not halachically. And he comes to Israel and he wants to make aliyah, but his parents were not affiliated or belonged to the reform or conservative congregation. And uh, their um, letters are not uh, relevant to the chief rabbinate. And when this guy wants to get married in Israel, he has a problem. He has to prove his Jewishness. Now in London, it's easily, it's relatively easy because, well, we'll go to the base then and eventually we'll find out if his parents are Jewish or not. By the way, I personally performed the wedding five years ago of a Knesset member in Israel that got married to a British girl, a Jewish British girl, and she had to go through a very long process of proving her Jewishness because her parents were British, but they did not get married the Lachati. But that's the easy case. The bad scenario is about the Russians because they come from a place where there was no Jewish life under the communist regime that was there for more than 70 years, there was no religious life there. There was no base in that could approve if somebody is Jewish or not. And there, they had no way to prove the Jewishness. We in Tsoa, we actually established a department that it's called Shorashim, Roots, that helps them to prove their Jewishness. So that's how we started. But today it's already an empire. We deal with ethical issues, with organ donations, with kashrut system. We deal with so many issues. Actually, you know, we are now dealing with preparing ourselves to the high, holi to the high holidays because uh, we know that we have every year more than 70,000 secular people that come to us. And we know that this year there will be most probably no shuls. We have to prepare ourselves to minyanim in the backyards, in the gardens, in, it's, a, it's a big job. And Baruch Hashem, we became actually the alternative uh, address for whoever who wants Jew, uh, Jewishness or want to experience Judaism in a way that will not coerce him, in a way that will inspire him. So if you had to define an aim, is it to provide accessible services to the less religious sector, or is it to encourage through a different approach greater religious buy-in? Is there a, a, an underpinning of Kiruv in what you're trying to do, Kiruv Rokhokim? No, we are not a Kiruv organization. We are not a Kiruv organization. We are, we believe that deep, deep in the hearts, every Jew wants to be engaged to Judaism. We don't want to tell him how to be, to engage himself and how to commit himself. We want him to be exposed to Judaism that is hidden from him. 
and he will choose, he will decide what it, so there will be people that has decided be, uh, in consequence to their exposure to us, they decided to put on film, but there were many Jews that did not do that. And we, we are not judgmental. Everybody, we want people to be proud with the Jewishness. We want them to respect the Jewishness, but more than any other things, they, we want them to be connected to Judaism in a way that they would be ready and to sacrifice something for their Judaism. We believe that if people will not be proud about their Judaism, they will not stay in Israel. Therefore, we want them to be engaged and to be committed in a certain degree to Judaism. So this is about Judaism, but it's also very much about a, a, a nationalistic expression of Judaism, staying within, within the state. Right. So, you know, what, one of the things you, um, you do in making yourself accessible is to make yourself affordable and to take on um, some of the bureaucratic work that the rabbinate normally throws back at the people, um, but then still charges for. How are you able to keep your prices um, down and to, be, and, and to be viable as, a, a, as, as an alternative establishment? First of all, uh, we, I, I want to admit that um, um, there are services, for instance, for weddings, we charge the couples a fee. So for them, they come to Tzohan not because we are cheaper than the rabbinate. We are more expensive than the rabbinate. Um, they pay for uh, to, to get to register for marriage, they pay us $50. It's not a lot of money, but in the rabbinate, you don't have to pay that. So once somebody decides to come to us, it's because he gets a better service and he gets better rabbis. And I mean, for you, I don't have to, to explain that. But in Israel, rabbi doesn't meet the couple before the wedding. If he's not at all a rabbi, we are the only rabbis that meet the couple before, before the wedding. So basically, we are based on, the, on donations. I mean, uh, we get 60% um, from our supporters in Israel, from our, from our budget in Israel and 40% we get from overseas. Right. Uh, how have your initiatives been received by the establishment? So it depends. I have to divide it to three categories. One, the rabbinate relies on us. For instance, on all the issues of proving Judaism, of immigrants, not only that they accept our um, approvals, but they are the biggest source that send people to us. I can get a phone call from the chief rabbi two days after he attacked me publicly about saying something. I could get a phone call two days later, please, Rav Stav, could you help this guy and this guy to prove his Jewishness? And, uh, and we will do that. I mean, we know the game. There is a part, one level is politics and one level is uh, assisting each other. So it, it's so... On Shorashim project, that's a non-controversial project, and not only non-controversial, but the rabbis, the chief rabbinate itself, actually sends to us people. There are projects like Yom Kippur, Purim, and other projects that are parallel to the rabbinate. I mean, the rabbinate doesn't deal with that, and they don't care about that. There are two projects that the rabbinate is a bit angry at us. One is the marriages, because actually, if we perform every year four, between four to 5,000 weddings a year, which is more than 25% of the secular weddings in Israel, um, they are insulted. I mean, why do they go to you and they don't come to us? And the second project is the Kashrut, because we said that um, monopoly is bad for quality of service and is bad for the quality of the kashrut, and we need to create competition. I don't have to explain this to people that live in Western countries that understand that actually the basis of, uh, of their um, economy is competition. Here in Israel, it's not that easy to explain that, especially when we, to we talk about religious services, but uh, I believe that more and more people understand that. Today, there is more understanding, even in the, among the rabbinate, that Tsar actually in the weddings and in the kashrut actually helps the rabbinate. Because, because of us, they had to improve the quality of services in the religious uh, uh, councils. And everybody admits that the level of the service 
has been has been uh, uh, increasing dramatically, and everybody says that it's because of the competition. I believe that the same thing will happen with the Kashmir. One of the things that's happened from the establishment of Sahar and its its publicity is that you become a a home address for strange questions. People feeling they can they can get sakalacha uh, with a little bit of sechel and an understanding and a breadth of knowledge. Hey, what are what are some of the uh, unusual questions that you've had to turn your mind to? Well, I can give you a lot of questions, uh, uh, um, but um, I will give you one example. Um, it's an example of, uh, you know, let's take an example from the corona. Soar actually led the decision in Israel that people should not go to shuls in the first wave of the corona. And we said that to follow the rules of gathering of 10 people in shuls is impossible mission because you cannot expect that the Gabbai or the Rabbi will start fighting with the 11th or 12th guy that arrives to shul. It's impossible. And we said, well, once the government has put the restriction of 10 people, let's shut down the shuls. It took the rabbis, the chief rabbi, had three weeks to understand that. Now let me give you another example. Weddings uh, during Sfirat Aum or during the three weeks. We don't know what will happen. But I came to the chief rabbi and said, look, there are differences of uh, customs between Ashkenazim and Sfardim. But when you go, the Sfardim do get married in the three weeks, the Ashkenazim do not. So I said to them, look, if a couple, you know, they're secular for three generations, to say that he's Ashkenazi just because his great grandpa his name is Edelstein or, uh, or Goldman, doesn't make sense. He doesn't know that he is Ashkenazi. He doesn't know that he's Fari. He's nothing. I mean, he, he has no background. He has no custom because he never, go to, he never goes to Shul. So why don't you, why don't you follow the minag of the Shulchan Aruch to allow him to get married? i give you just two examples. I could give you hundreds of examples. Right. And, uh, you know, the religious community has been particularly hard hit by, by COVID, by the coronavirus. I won't ask if that's some kind of judgment on us. But do you think there are lessons to be learned about the orthodox, the religious approaches to life and approaches to health um, that have come out of the, the, the last several months of experience? Look, um... Again, it's Shiva Sabetamus tonight, and I try to uh, to guard myself not to say to filter between the what I think and what I say. But first of all, there is no um, replacement to common sense, and I tell everybody: if your rabbi says something, says something that doesn't make sense then it's against the Torah. Because the Torah must make sense. If it doesn't make sense, so then the rabbi is wrong. You know, when I saw the, the film, when one of the biggest gdoilim said, well, it's not, it's not a disease. Well, it's not a devil. Because there are not three people out of 500 that died within three days which is the halachic definition for devil, I say to myself, what a broch, what a chilol Hashem, what we are going to face here in the, in the future. And I said to, to myself, and I said to my congregants, please, when you see, when you think that I say something that doesn't make sense, don't hesitate to make a phone call, to send me an email and to correct me. Because, and that's the first lesson. I think that, what the, the way religious people behaved in the first wave, and by the way, even now, is the biggest Chilol Hashem that occurred in the, in the last 20, 25 years in Israel. I cannot remember such a situation where f hundreds of boys, of yeshiva boys, are sent to, uh, to hospitals, and worse than hospitals, to hotels, 
on the expenses of the government and they feel that they do a favor to the government because they were the ones that did not follow the rules. They were the ones that are now cause a damage to the Israeli economy. The proportions of the religious people in the sick people and in the dead people in the Israeli community are five times the percentage in the, in the population. And when I speak today with a secular guy and he says to me, you can't imagine how I hate what you represent, your colleagues, because, because I have to pay your crimes. It's not that I show solidarity because, well, that was the case. Coincidentally, you are the sick and not me. You, were, you are responsible for this crime because you did not follow the orders. The Rosh Hashiva that didn't allow his students to, to take the tests and to make sure that they are not sick just because he says, well, it's nonsense. We don't have to follow these rules. It's somebody that has to be sent to jail, not less than that. So, well, you, I'm, I'm sorry that that's after filtering. I have much more to say, but I think it's enough. So, yeah, I'm just going to tease that point a little more. There was a, a piece written by uh, Yuval Cherlo, who is uh, one of your uh, strong ethical uh, poskim um, within, within Sohar, um, where, where the question was asked about reporting neighbors and people who don't uh, adhere to um, the government lockdown requirements and whether or not one should uh, um, phone the authorities. And the, 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 the quotation in, uh, that, that I've got from him is, uh, someone who stays silent is being ethically negligent because there are ethical and halachic imperatives not to stay silent when others are in distress. Um, so uh, I, I just had my pre three weeks haircut today, which is, my, uh, which is also my immediate post sphera haircut, um, probably the first time since, uh, since Burim. And my, my hairdresser said that he was absolutely devastated. He's trying to do the right thing. Everybody's putting on gloves when they come on, not touching anything. He gives them a fresh surgical mask. He's an advisor. He says lots of the hairdressers around the neighborhood are not keeping appropriate distances and are not, uh, are not, not wiping the place down. And he's got a strict appointment system. And, and he's, worried that, he's worried that if, uh, you know, if, if the hairdressers start spreading the coronavirus in another way, it'll be every hairdresser that's closed down and he's going to lose his parnasa. Um, but he's terrified to report other hairdressers because it's going to reflect badly on the hairdressers. Um, I, said, I said, you know, I had read from Ralph Stubbs' organization that he should report them. I could um, tell you personally. Pardon? I sent, I could tell you from my experience, I sent policemen to my to a synagogue that did not obey to the rules and I sent the police I, the rabbi of Shoham sent the police of Shoham to give reports to congregants in one of the shuls that did not obey to the rules and I knew that they are not obeying to the rules, I personally sent the police there and I will do that in the future, if it will be needed. Because I think we are dealing with something that could kill thousands of people in Israel and who will be able to say afterwards that he is not responsible if he did not do the what is expected from us to do. Just on some of the ethical questions that have come up in, uh, you know, in COVID, I, how does one choose who ought to be treated um, and in what order? Um, you know, within within halacha, if you read the uh, you know if you read the Rambam, there are certain certain things where you would give precedence to a Torah sage, for example, in the way things happen, or people have a certain chazakar, and there are certain precedents. You know, if people appear needing a ventilator, who do you choose? Who should be the first person to go on a ventilator? Well, first of all, you deal with some of the most practical, unfortunately, question, but one of the most sensitive. Because I, I don't think there is a bigger gap between what is on the surface seems to be our sages' perception and the way we implement this 
today. If we had to implement simplistically what Chazal is saying, I could tell you that we would be in a very, very big trouble. Just imagine, I will say in Israel, or the rabbinate, let's say the chief rabbinate will say, well, if you have one breathing machine, the prioritization should be to a rabbi before a regular person. That's already, I don't have to continue the mission. That's already the end of the story. I mean, we are finished. So we are lucky that there were a few rabbis 20, 30 years ago. Rav Shlomo Zaman Oerbach was one of them that taught us that with all the respect to our sages and without having any tool to understand what's the difference, but today we don't do that. Today we use common sense with relying on halachic issues, uh, sources, but not, we don't prioritize as the rabbis were prioritizing uh, 2,000 years ago. What counts for us the most is the chances of the person, of the man or woman to recover. If we see that there is, we have one machine and one, two people need it, but one has a better chance, let's say 90% it will be recovered. And the other one has 5% to be recovered or 10% to be recovered, we will use it to, um, to the one that has the chances to, to be recovered. That's the main rule, but to go into all the details requires a long session. I hope that we will not need to deal with this soon and it will remain only a, a potential class for Shavuos night uh, for something to deal with theoretically uh, as I was doing this year in my community. But uh, I really uh, hope that we will not need to come to it because it will be very, very bad. So one of the practical questions that's very much at the forefront of certainly the British press at the moment is, you know, everybody accepts the idea that there is a value in saving lives. And, you know, we, we've got copious sources that say to save a life is to save the world. Kuach Nefesh is one of the highest values in every respect. But the trade-off for being risk averse has been that within families and communities, there has been pressure placed that has led to domestic abuse and it's uh, it's been difficult for people to be together um there's been a lack of outlets there's also been a, a huge issue with the, the the health of the economy and the consequence of the health of the economy is people being able to support themselves afterwards and everything like that how much should we you know how much do we put the risk to health and life in a COVID sense against the risk to livelihood and welfare? You know, how do we balance those issues when you have a lockdown situation? Well, first of all, uh, it's, it's an amazing question because it requires, it, it depends on so many assumptions that I guess that if you take, uh, it's just if you take two Jews, you have three positions. In this case, if you take two professors of, for economy or for public health, you will get also three opinions. Basically, we understand that economy is not less important than saving lives. Because eventually, if the country doesn't have resources to provide people jobs and people could not bring food home, they, uh, they will not be able to survive. And forget the, uh, the uh, mental and social influences of uh, losing jobs, etc., etc. The Gemara says that in order to, if somebody wants to work as a hunter, a hunter is something which is uh, requiring a kind of a risk, you know, the bear or the lion or the whatever could, or the tiger could, uh, could kill you. So the Nod of Yudha writes a very, very interesting tshuva that for panasa, for earning money, although that's not the nicest job 
for Jews. He says it's required to be a hunter. It requires a crime of brutality and cruelness, etc., etc. But it's, but halakhically speaking, he says it's legitimate to work as a hunter or even to volunteer to an army, even if you know that you will have to sacrifice your life, not for the Jewish state, for the British government or for other governments, uh, just in order to get Panasa. Which means that to a certain degree, the Alaha recognizes the need of having Panasa even on the expense of taking risks. Now, what is the risk? What's the percentage? Wow, it's too hard, it's too difficult to decide, and not for me here to say 5%, 10%, I think it's not proper. Do you think there's gonna be a change in people's attitudes to shuls and smachot as a result of uh, what's been happening? Well, I, 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 if you wouldn't ask this, I would ask myself. Um, I wanted to know, and I, again, I want to connect it to the three weeks where, that we start tonight. And what I'm saying now will sound at the beginning as a joke, but trust me that I'm saying this from the depth of my heart. We were here out of, from the shuls in Israel for two months. And when we came back to the shuls, I saw that many people did not show up. And not because they were sick, and not because they were under risk, but because they discover they discovered the convenience of davening home. First of all, it's, uh, it makes the davening much shorter. Instead of coming for two or three hours, you make it haplap in one hour, within one hour, you are done. Number two, you daven with your family. Number three, it's very close to the home. And I said in the first Shabbos that I came back, and when I realized that instead of seeing, let's say, 70% of the congregation, I saw hardly 20% or 30% of the congregation, I said publicly the following. I said, you know, when the temple was destroyed, I'm sure that in the first two, or three, four weeks, everybody was crying. Wow, how we deeply miss the temple. How could we do that? How will we be, the Gemara says, how will we be able to eat meat and to drink wine when we have no sacrifices? Aviva. But nevertheless, a few months later, a few years later, everybody eats meat, everybody drinks wine, everybody goes to shul, and today, if you ask me, not others, what do you prefer, to go to the Besamikdash or to dive in close to your shul? I'm not sure about the answer. Because the shul is much more convenient. Personally, I don't like to see a lot of blood, bloodshed on the floor. I'm not sure that's my, that's my dream to see all the bloodshed of the sacrifices. So people get used to it. And they saw all the positive aspects of davening in, in shul instead of davening in Beit English. So I'm saying this as a kind of a warning to us. If we, the rabbis, we will not make sure when we come back to the shul after the corona is over, but completely over, if we will not make sure that davening in synagogue will be attractive, will be inspiring, People will stay at their homes because to daven at home sometimes is much easier. Right. I, I've been I've been told from you know my online experience I'm going to have to keep my sermons shorter as a consequence. That's one of the things. See that? And certainly with a mask on, that's that's uh, that's going to happen. No doubt. I, I'm saying that not just for you, but there are lots of people who are watching who are wondering about coming back. I'm going to be keeping my sermons shorter. Yeah, please do come back. No doubt. Um, as long as it's safe to do so. Um, so. One, one, you know, one, one of the things that uh, th that I want to know is um, s using media and social media has been um, one of the things that has happened a lot for both Chinuch but also as an as an avenue for services over the last period. 
um, people have been tuning in online and there's been a lot of discussion as you know whether or not that counts as being a, a part of a minyan or the ability to hear things you know can you should you respond amen do you think that the corona experience is actually going to change the way we incorporate technology into into our worship and reconsider some of the prioritizations on Shabbat and Chagim? It's very difficult to predict what, how will this uh, process end? Because it depends in, some, in a few things that are unknown at the moment. There is a difference if the corona will take place for two or three years, God forbid, or it will be over in a few months once we will find, please God, uh, a vaccine to deal with this. So that's one answer. But to respond directly to, to your question, I really believe that the impact of the, of the uh, Zoom and other issues is already, is already here. Whether it will, it will change the worship in Shul or not, it's one question. But the fact that we talk now uh, via Zoom, and I don't have to, to come to London to be a scholar in residence, but I could talk to you, to you and to your congregants uh, in this tool, through this tool is telling you already the change. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, and I mentioned here, Adam Siegel uh, that is working with us in SOAR, uh, was organizing a meeting uh, with, um, um, no? with a very famous lawyer, his name, uh, uh, I don't know, Ma from uh, from United from New York, and in this uh, Zoom Alan meeting, Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz, we, in this uh, Zoom conversation, we had maybe eighty people from South Africa, from England, from Australia, from United States. I mean, the boundaries and the distances are, are almost not important. I mean. We can talk to everybody all the time. So this will lead for a change, will lead a change. But I want to say one thing that I, I'm sure that will never change it, with all the technologies. Nothing will replace the personal relationship between people. And nothing will replace the hug and the embracing and the smile and the, and the personal and intimate, and intimate relationship between people. And therefore, after saying that we, without dealing with, without going into the halachic aspect, whether it's allowed or not allowed to, to participate in such a minion or not, but the fact that you don't see the people, you're not a part of them, that's, that's what makes the difference. And I think that Judaism is allowed a lot about the warmth of community. And I think that's, by the way, one of the, th the issues that we in Israel are jealous at the congregations in, in England and in other places. When we see the warmth and the connection that congregants are connected one, one to another, that's something that we want to follow from. We want to copy from you. And uh, we, we don't want to, um, it doesn't, it's not enough for us uh, to see people through Zoom. We want to feel them. We want to be a part of them. So I'm going to uh, suggest anybody who's got a particular question, please use the uh, participants tab and uh, raise your hands. Uh, one of the outcomes of the 2012 um, World Cup in South Africa was a report on the vuvuzelas, these uh, trumpety things that they used, and the spreading of disease through the vuvuzela. And there's a fascinating report. They, they were, they're incredibly dangerous. Um, and at the moment, the guidelines that we're receiving suggest that we will not be able to blow shofar indoors. But, you know, the World Cup was outdoors and it's quite possible that we might be told it's not responsible to blow the shofar outdoors. You know, what would happen if we were given an instruction, you can't blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah? You know, how, how, how do we deal with that? It's so important to us. Wow. We're going to get one day of it this year, but how do we deal with it? Look, I can't imagine such a decision in Israel. Very simple, because the coalition will fall apart in the same minute. The idea will just be brought up. 
So I can't imagine. But now let's talk about this question rationally. Well, it depends. If scientists would come and say, we know as a fact that the corona is spreading through air and this is dangerous, I'm, I'm sure that there are solutions. But if that would be the conclusion, what's the difference between any halakha that pikuach nefesh is above not only pikuach nefesh, safek, even if we have only a doubt. But you know, the doubt has to rely on something. If the scientists will say, well, this could lead to, the, to sicknesses, I will definitely recommend sick people or people that are under uh, risk. Uh, elder people, people that have problems in heart, etc., etc. Not to come. Chole, if he's sick, if he's sick, he's potter. He, 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 is not committed to come into here to listen to the show for under such circumstances. But it's hard for me to believe that such a thing will happen. Right, I have a question from Jeremy Mendel. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, Rab Stav, um, so what do you think um, the Israeli rabbinate could learn or uh, Israeli Jewish establishment could learn from the UK? And what could the UK learn from the Israeli establishment? You want an honest answer, or you want a politically correct answer? Uh, no, I think an honest answer, I would have said. Okay. I think that, first of all, um, what we have to learn, and we have a lot to learn from the United Synagogue, you see, when I, I was several times in England, what I really admire about the United Synagogue is the fact that I know that 50, 60, 70, I don't want to, uh, to be mistaken, to be corrected, but between 50 to 80% in different uh, communities are people that not necessarily are observant, but they still feel connected to the congregation and they feel committed to the Jewishness, even though they are not fully observant. That's a secret that we have to copy to Israel. And if you ask me, what is the challenge of Zohar that we haven't yet found out what is the formula, how to do that? Now, I know that the circumstances are different and Jews in the Gola are um, a bit different than Jews in Israel for various reasons. But, but yet, what is the formula to bring, to connect, to engage Jews uh, that are not observant to shows is something which is for us a secret that we haven't, a formula that we haven't discovered yet. Um, what I think that uh, the United uh, Synagogues or what the Jewish community should learn from Israel not to copy the mistakes of the Israeli rabbinate, not to copy them to England. And unfortunately, sometimes I feel that uh, a few rabbis in England are jealous at the power of the chief rabbinate in Israel and they want to copy that bad model to England. So you have to be careful. Uh, politically carefully phrased there. Um, when, when you... I, I, I asked Jeremy if he wants me to be honest or politically correct. We always appreciate the candor. I, do you do you ever find that there are spiritual models or religious ideas that you see from other religions and faiths around that 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 are oh, good practice? Think that we could adopt? Well, it's a very uh, interesting question. I personally, uh, but I, I I'm not an expert in that. I personally, I'm a part of groups that run a lot of interfaith dialogues with Christians and with uh, Muslim imams and leaders. I know that all of them are in crisis. I spoke two or three years ago with a mission of uh, priests from Australia that arrived to Israel and I was asked to share with them some ideas and I asked them about uh, 
their experience. How do they deal with the modernity, with modern issues, with modern challenges? And if I summarize what they've told me after that meeting or during that meeting, if I summarize, actually, we don't know how to deal with modernity. So when I say I have a lot of respect when I see the seriousness of Muslims, how the, the, way, the way they take seriously their religion, but to tell you that I'm inspired by the values, not always. Um, I'm, I'm inspired by the being determinist to implement the values, but not, I, I, I don't see that there are values in Christianity and in, uh, in, in Muslim uh, practice that sound to me something well. I've never been, exp I never heard about such a perception. No, I think uh, all of the ideas are, are, are inside the Yiddishkeit in, in Judaism, but could be that I'm not an expert for that. I, 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 although I'm involved a lot, I didn't, I didn't see that um, we as Jews, we should learn a lot from them. I always have, get the impression that they are very interested to learn from us uh, because they feel uh, to us just like an elder sister that, uh, but again, could be that I'm an ignorant in that. I don't want to say th something that, that I'm not 100% positive about. Um. I've got a question uh, about decorum in places of worship. Um, just been put, put uh, sent to me on chat. Uh, what, what do you think should be the mood in a, in a synagogue? Now you got to one, you touch one of the challenges, I guess all over the world. In Israel, I feel that this is one of the biggest challenges. Today, to come to synagogue, and I will be not politically correct, is one of the most boring experiences for most of the people that come there. They are not interested in what is said there. They read all the Shabbos paper, and in Israel, unlike England, we have plenty of them. When you come to shul, you have shelves full with Shabbos letters that could tell you about politics under the cover of religious politics, but it's politics just like any other politics. And I see the, the Gabe announces, well, then everybody is awake, but when you see the Torah relating and other parts of davening, and I, I have discussions with my kids, and my kids that all of them are from, tell me, keep on telling me, we hate to come to show because we are not inspired there. Nothing is interesting there. So if the question is, what would I expect from a shul? And to tell you that I know how to do that, the answer is no. I would like to see shul as a place that when people come and gather there, the, number one, they're happy to come there. And number two, there is something that is happening there. Is it singing? Is it, uh, is it uh, discussion between people, what they, what they feel and how they want to express their gratitude or the needs to, to God or whatever? I don't know how to, to implement the, what I'm saying, but I know that the situation today is unbearable. It's, 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 it's a disaster. What have you been trying in Shoam? I've been trying different uh, things. I've been trying to try davening with singing, to begin davening with singing. I've been trying, uh, I've been, been encouraging people to make um, um, Kalibach's Minyanim. Uh, I've been trying to make a uh, kind of learning before davening. I've been trying to shorten davening. Um, I've been trying to make uh, learning between, uh, um, after Shachwit, before Tor, uh, I can, if I was successful, I would be, I would be a millionaire for that startup. 
The fact that I'm not was probably is that uh, I haven't had uh, too many success, too much success. People keep asking, you know, can we shorten davening? And when you talk about shortening davening, what exactly can you do to shorten the, t- the, the, the service? First of all, all the mishaberachs. Number one, all the mishaberachs. In at one period in the shul, uh, our uh, instructions were that there is only one ole, no seven aliyot. The balkoire is the one that is making the brochas. One, one is reading, and this one is making seven times baruchoy Hashem vorach, etc., etc. No mishaberachs. This for itself shortened the daven for 20, 25 minutes. And my son comes over to me after that. You see, Abba, how things could look better if you just make it a bit different? So that's just an example. Um, now, I, I want you to know something. I really, I personally don't feel that the davening is long. And I love canto. And when I come to overseas and I see and I hear a good canto, I'm... Uh, I'm in paradise. It's not my personal experience that the davening is, is, is boring. I'm describing the youngster's uh, experience. So that's one example. I think that one of the changes that should be done is instead of saying all psukede zimra, is to learn two verses of psukede zimra, just to learn, to understand what we are saying. And this, as tov me'at bechavana, it's better to daven less with intention rather than a lot and just re- reading. Now, what's the problem? What is the concern? Why we as rabbis, we all, we all the rabbis know that. Why we don't do that? Because we are afraid that it, eventually it will end up me'at, a little, without kavana. So the question is now, what is better? To daven a lot without kavana, or to daven a bit, a little, with, without kavana, without intention? Well, that's a challenge. Okay, uh, a question from, uh, from, from Linda. She says, uh, as COVID is a worldwide problem, as with many medical issues, how do the rabbis manage to unite regarding halachic decisions, e.g. for the formats of shul services, as with transplants, etc.? You know, how, how, do, how do you get halachic opinion formed on such things? So, first of all, to say rabbis unite is contradiction by essence. I mean, rabbi, by definition, rabbis could not be united. Because wherever you have two people, you have three opinions. Practically speaking, I could tell you that, uh, for instance, in Sohar, we have a council of rabbis, and in an every public decision, we gather ourselves by Zoom, by Zoom and we take the decisions together by uh, voting. Um, but I guess that most rabbis, or many rabbis that are not under umbrella of Zohar, uh, I guess each one of them takes the decision for himself. I guess, uh, you know, there are uh, more distinguished rabbis and more respected rabbis and less. And I guess people consult with each other. Um, I, I think that's the way uh, rabbis uh, form their opinions. I hear, uh, I get all the chuvas of Rebusha Weiss, which is a very famous Haredi rabbi. I get the chuvas of Reversal Schechter from uh, New York, which is a very famous distinguished rabbi in America. So uh, I get their Whatever they write, we get right away by mail or by WhatsApp. And uh, we read, we analyze. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. You know, just like uh, Robert. Right. Rav Ra- Weiss has been absolutely prolific over the last several weeks. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been lovely reading his material. Question from Jonathan Taylor. Uh, good evening, Rav Stav. Nice to see you again. Um, I, uh, I know that Tsar has been engaged many, many years in trying to resolve the issue of the, uh, the non-Jewish uh, status of uh, th- hundreds of thousands of Russian Jews. 
and this issue all the time is raising its head. How is, what is your general approach and how do you solve these, uh, in, some, in some cases, generations of Jews who are halakhically not Jewish, but still live in the state of Israel, serve in the army, and as far as they're concerned, want to be considered as part of Kahal, uh, Kahal Yisrael? So first of all, you touch a very, a very important problem in Israel. Um, to be honest, I think that uh, the solution is not, will not happen soon because of two reasons. Number one, because most of the Russians don't want to convert. Because in Israel today, it's very easy to be non-Jewish and to be an Israeli. Because most of the secular people couldn't care less about the fact that their son gets married to a Jewish girl or to a non-Jewish girl, they, they don't care. So, uh, so that's, the, that's one answer. The second reason why it's not going to happen, because the demands that the chief rabbinates puts uh, in front of the candidates to convert are unacceptable for 90% of them. And the 10% that do accept that, they pretend that they do accept that. They, after they finish converting, they behave just like they behaved before. So as, as long as the situation will be that number one, the Russians don't want to convert. And number two, the chief rabbinate raises um, standards that the vast majority of the Russians is not ready to accept and is ready to accept only to, they pretend to accept, there will be no, no solution to that. What do I suggest? It's not my suggestion. It's, I'm following Rabbi Nachum Rabinovitz that passed away a few weeks ago. And I was a part of his team that suggested the following. The halacha recognizes conversion of minors under the age of 12 and 13, 12 for girls and 13 for boys, even though they are not completely accepting upon themselves Torah and mitzvot. In this way, we don't have to put the Russians in a, in a contradiction between their practical life and being Jewish. And halakhically, it's much better to convert in this way rather than asking them to lie in front of the based in and, and a few days later to come back to behave like uh, a non-observant people. What is the advantage of that? The advantage of that, that once you talk to the families and you explain them that you want to convert the kids, and I'm, I have experience with that because I personally am involved in this conversion, you see more and more families that want to convert the kids and as a result of this process, they are ready not to cook on Shabbat, to eat kosher. You have to understand that in Israel, unlike London, to eat kosher in Israel, it's not such a big challenge. I mean, you have to be a very, very from secular in order to find a non-kosher uh, supermarket for meat. I mean, for most Russians, it should be a very big effort to find a place that will sell them non-kosher meat. So to keep separation between meat and, day and milk, that's not a big, a, big, a big issue. So for most of them, the converting of the minors should be the solution and could be a solution. Unfortunately, the chief rabbinate does not agree to that, not because they don't know that this is the right solution. They know that. As a matter of fact, they even wrote articles before they became chief rabbis that approved this, this uh, uh, decision. But because of political pressure, uh, they don't want to encourage this process. And uh, therefore, we are stuck with this problem. A question from Tony. Hello, um, it's from Anne. From Anne. <laughs> Hello, um, Rabbi Stav. Yeah, very interesting, thank you. How can you involve women more in synagogal life in Israel? First of all, by the way, in Soha, we have uh, more than 450 women. 
that are bright counselors and uh, we are very proud with them. They are uh, big partners in, uh, in the leadership of Tzohar. Uh, by the way, we have one of, one of the board, we have few women in the board, uh, but one of the, one of the women is an English woman, uh, Madeleine Black, that made Aliyah, maybe you know, a few years ago. Um, now, I think that uh, involvement of women in shul requires a few things. There is the halachic dimension and there is the social dimension. In the halachic dimensions, I have no news. I guess what is permitted, permitted, and what's not permitted is not permitted. And I, I think that there are not too many news in that. But in all the social aspects of involvement in shul, I think they could be done much more. I will give two examples. For instance, the location of women. Where should be the women located? How will, be, will they be able to feel that what is going on in shul is not behind the screen, but they are a part of it? One example. Second example, how could we involve, involve them in giving shiurim if they want, if they are capable to do it? Um, for instance, now, when there are restrictions, I could, tell, I could share with you an anecdote from today. In one of our shuls, in one of the shuls, because of the restrictions of numbers, that now we are restricted to 20, so the Gabbai wrote a letter without asking the rabbi in his shul, and without asking me, he wrote a letter as follows. And he says, well, since we have almost 80 people that come to shul, and we are, and we are allowed to put in, in uh, one space only 20. So to the men part will come 20 men. And to the woman part will come 20 men. And to another whole room will come 20 men. And to another porch will come 20 men. Now you can imagine how the woman reacted to this letter. And they sent me a letter. The rabbi, are you approving that? Is, are you accepting the fact that women that want to come every, and they do come every Shabbos to shul, and because of these restrictions, they, they will be excluded from shul? That's just an example of things that uh, should be changed. Right. So, so coming to the, um, the, the, the three weeks, you've painted a picture of of some of the challenges facing Israeli society and some of the tensions within it, and even even we've only addressed within the Jewish world, within Israel or the people who affiliate with the Jewish world. Uh, coming into the three weeks, have you got any message of hope for us? Something to something for us to feel that maybe beyond Tisha B'Av, there's something that we can look forward to. Well, well let's let's take things in proportion. I want you to know, I am, uh, I was once in Kinlos. I don't know if, if that was one of, a part of my speech or not, but in the recent couple of months, I keep on repeating that. First of all, we have to realize, we live in the most privileged generation of Jewish history, I dare to say, since David Amelich. I don't want to say better than in the time of David Amelich, but at least in the same level of David Amir. There was never a situation that the Jewish people, number one, were under independence, sovereignty, as we have today, a strong, strong economy, strong government, strong nation. And we were never under situation where Jews all over the world lived with free with equality and freedom of choice. And it never existed in Jewish history that we have these two uh, phenomena, that we live with Jewish independence and sovereignty and Jews in the diaspora live with freedom and equality. So first of all, let's express our gratitude to Hashem for for that, and and we don't, we should not take this for granted. The truth is that when I fast tomorrow at Shiva Sabetamos, the truth is that I'm not full with confidence that I should fast. 
because I'm so happy with what we have today in Israel. For me, it's much better than the time of the Second Temple, no doubt. You know, to come to Tisha B'Av, for me to say the prayer of Nahem, and if you will read carefully the words, you will find that you say words that are false, that are lies. You will say that Yerushalayim is without her son. Yerushalayim is desolated. Without, is a desert. Without her sons. There was, Jerusalem was never so populated as it's populated today. Never, never in Jewish history. So, number one, we have to be full of gratitude and full of pride that we are privileged to live in this area. But privilege does not come without commitment. Because as we have learned from Jewish history, we are the biggest enemies of ourselves. We never collapsed because of our external threats. It was always us that destroyed ourselves. This was the case in the first temple when the division of Judea kingdom and Israelite kingdom have split it up and this was the beginning of the collapse of the Israel of the Jewish empire and the same thing occurred in the second temple so our commitment and our obligation is to see how each one of us could contribute a bit to bridge gaps to try to unite ourselves and to understand that if we're given that present, that gift from Hashem, it's not because we are, we deserve it. It's most probably because of our parents, because of the sacrifice of our parents, maybe in the Holocaust, maybe in the Inquisition, maybe in the pogroms, because of others. It's not that we, we don't feel that we are such righteous people, that we deserved all this good that Hashem has given to us. But if we got this gift, we have to do a bit in order to pay back. And each one of us, and I think that's, that's, my, that's what I devote my, la- devote my life for. That's my life mission, to try to connect and to engage more and more Jew- Jewish people to the Jewish values, to the Jewish vision, to the Jewish world, and to unite them and to connect them more to Israel, more to the Jewish future, not, not to, it's not enough for us to be connected to the Jewish past. We need to be connected to the Jewish future and to engage ourselves to the Jewish future. That's, that's my message. So, Rastav, it looks like you have the energy to keep on going, but, and I know you said you weren't sure if you were going to be fasting, but you've only got a little bit of time left to have a drink of water and to be able to get yourself ready for the fast. It's uh, half past 11 in, uh, in Israel. I'd like to thank you so much for your frank insight, your inspirational words, your thoughts, your vision, the work that you have committed yourself to doing within Israeli society for the whole Jewish world. It's been Wonderful to be able to share this evening with you. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank Adam Siegel, who has been uh, sitting in on the call. I, I got to know Adam while we were well while we were in Sydney. I worked with his father on a couple of projects. Adam was an outstanding educator, a top-level educator in Melbourne, and is now the international resource development manager for Tsar. And he comes over here occasionally. It's been lovely to touch base with him. I'd like to, I would like just to say one more word. Go on. I would like to add one more word. I want you to know the, your congregants and yourself. We in Israel, and I see this, something that is very new. We think a lot of our brothers and sisters overseas. It was never in Israel expressed in such a way that it's expressed in the last couple of months. And trust me, I'm an Israeli for more than 60 years. and. I have never experienced such solidarity to hear what's going on in London and what's going on in New York and what's going on in other communities worldwide. And I think that we really share 
the same faith, the same vision, the same faith. And uh, I really want to wish all of you a lot of success, a lot of health under the leadership of the rabbi. And I want to wish all of us that maybe until tomorrow morning, the first day will become a source of pride and joy and happiness as the prophet has promised us. Amen. Now, I just wanted to wish Adam a B'Sha'at Tova as he's about to become a grandpa for the first time of a baby here in, uh, please God, in London. So we look forward to you being able to uh, join back with us. And uh, Rav Stav, we look forward to you joining us in London. Yeah, Everybody on this call, please, please do join me next Wednesday evening when at 8.15 I'm interviewing the author Stephen Uzel, who has written the book, I Am Juden, uh, a novel based on a factual account of a Jew who worked undercover as a Nazi within the SS, within the Krakow camp and ghetto. Um, so please join me next Wednesday evening. Before that, please keep well, fast well, look after yourselves, and uh, I look forward to seeing you either online or even better in person soon over the next several days. I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Rav uh, Lawrence. Really uh, very interesting. Thank Thanks, you. Evan. See you tomorrow morning.